Well, welcome everybody. I'm uh, David Kaz. I'm president of DMK Metal. I'm a, uh, my business, I'm a gold and silver buyer. So I buy the stuff the kids and the grandkids don't want, the old flatware, jewelry, uh, coins, although I usually tell my clients they should keep a lot of their coins. I think it's a good way to invest in gold and silver. Uh, I've been doing it for about 10 years. And uh, when I was a kid, my grandfather gave me silver dollars and then I got into coin collecting. And then back in the early 80s, I got more excited about silver than I was about coins. So I've been into silver at least since I was a kid. And then about 10 years ago, I started this business. Now this presentation is a lot of information. I'm gonna throw a lot at you. And I recommend that you do some of your own research on anything that you think I might be making up or uh, you know, stretching the truth. I have a lot of conspiracy theories in here. And uh, I call it, it's all about gold. And it's because I think it is all about gold. Whether it be wars, almost every war, if not every war fought throughout history is about gold. Uh, government debt, uh, banking collapses, uh, the devaluation of our currency, it's all about gold. All right, so I'm gonna dive in. I'm gonna save questions for the end and happy to answer as many questions as you might have. All right, so I used to call this presentation uh, Demystifying Gold and Silver. And it's because historically gold has had a very uh, mystical, magical, religious connotation to it. So it was first discovered by the Egyptians 5,000 years ago. And uh, they said it came from the sun god Ra. And in essence, they were right because gold does come from the explosion of stars. So they were pretty accurate. Uh, in the Bible, gold is mentioned hundreds of times. It's in the book of Genesis. Uh, one of the gifts given to baby Jesus was gold. The Ark of the Covenant was gold the golden calf. Uh, if you look at old paintings, Michelangelo, all those artists, whenever you had a halo, it was gold. So gold has really had this mystical, uh, magical connotation to it. Almost every religion uses it in their symbology. So now let's bring it down to earth. What is gold? Well, gold is an element. So here's, if I take you back to uh, high school chemistry, if we can remember back in high school, this is the periodic table. This is all the precious metals right here in the middle. And of all the precious metals, only gold has that golden yellow color to it. You know, iridium, rhodium, platinum, palladium, silver are all silver colored. So only gold has that uh, golden color to it. Now, gold and silver are weighed in troy ounces. So a troy ounce is heavier than a regular ounce. So there's 16 ounces to a, a pound. There's 14 and a half troy ounces to a pound. So whenever you hear gold is $2,000 an ounce, it's troy ounce. So precious metals are known as the troy elements. And here you can see the density of precious metals. And you'll note that gold is almost double the density of silver. So here are two one ounce coins. These are uh, gold eagle and silver eagle, the most popular coins in the United States. The gold eagle is almost half the size of the silver eagle because gold is double the density. They weigh exactly the same amount, but the gold coin is much smaller. And you'll notice that platinum is even more dense than gold. Platinum is more scarce than gold. Uh, however, gold is double the price of platinum, and it has been for several years now. And it has to do with the fact that gold and silver are known as monetary metals. So historically, gold and silver have been used as money. You're going to hear me talk a lot about gold and silver as money, so as a means of exchange, whereas platinum never really was used as money. Uh, palladium never was used as money. So one of the reasons that gold is more valuable than platinum, even though it's more scarce, is that it is, it is a monetary metal. All right, so gold has special properties. I mentioned it's the only precious metal that is gold color. It's, it's got that golden luster to it. It's very ductile, very malleable. You can take a one ounce coin of gold and stretch a wire a mile long and it won't break. Uh, it's also one of the best conductors of electricity and of heat. So whenever you open up your cell phone, your computer, your TV, you'll see gold plated elements in there. It's because gold is such a good conductor of electricity. Uh, gold doesn't tarnish. So one of the, another reason it's great money is if you had a buried treasure and you dug it up, it's gonna look just as good as it was the day you put it down there. So if you remember uh, King Tut's tomb, uh, was here about 30 years ago at the Museum of Science and Industry. It was bright and shiny, just like it was 5,000 years ago. When Mel Fisher found the Atosha, uh, off the coast of Florida and pulled up all those gold coins. They were just as shiny as you know, 500 years ago when that ship sunk. Uh, gold is very scarce, but it is found on every continent. So another reason gold is good money is its scarcity. 
right? It's got that uh, value because of its scarcity. Uh, and it's very dense, like I said in that last, uh, last slide. All right, so historically, there was about a 5% annual increase of gold across the world, right? So digging out of the ground, you're actually digging money out of the ground through mining. The gold would increase by 5% and the population would increase by 5%. So gold as money could keep a stable price because it kept up with the growth of population. So it made for great money because of that. Uh, today, a highly producing gold mine, you get about one gram of gold for every ton of rock. So you got to dig out one ton to get to one little gram, and that's a highly, highly producing mine. You know, back when the Egyptians discovered uh, gold along the River Nile, you know, it's not like they'd walk around and kick gold on the ground, but it was very easy to find. Now all the easy gold has been found. It's very hard to find gold. Uh, silver is interesting because uh, there's very few primary silver mines. Silver is usually a byproduct of mining for other metals. So mining for gold, copper, aluminum is where most of the silver comes from. There's not that many silver mines. And uh, almost every ounce of gold that's been dug up is still in existence in jewelry, coins, and bars. Almost every ounce of silver is in landfills and has is, is just been used up in industry. And that's because its value is lower. It wasn't recycled nearly as much as gold. Coming out of the ground, there's about nine ounces of silver for every one ounce of gold. All right, some people say it's seven to one, but I'm, I'm going with nine to one. All right, so here's a little bit of history. So 5,000 years ago, the Egyptians found gold. Now, every one of the dynasties that came along, the Greeks, the Romans, the British, whenever they were conquering other lands, what were they doing? They were taking the assets from those countries. What was the main asset? Gold. So throughout history, as uh, dynasties, as uh, countries that had power were expanding and colonizing, they were taking the gold from those countries that they uh, took over. Now, Egypt, I mentioned, was the first to discover gold, use gold. They used it as a means of exchange. They had what was known as grains of gold. They didn't make coins, so they didn't have a determined amount of gold in exchange, but they had grains of gold. And you could give maybe 10 grains of gold for a camel, or maybe 20 grains of gold for a wife. Whatever you were buying, you could use gold as a means of exchange. Uh, they did use it more for religious uses. Uh, when you buried a, a pharaoh, you buried him with all his gold. So when you go into those, uh, those pyramids, you find a lot of gold hanging out there with the, with the pharaohs and the kings. Um, now, the first country to make coins was known as Lydia, which is no longer in, exist in existence. It was in Asia Minor, and it's now Turkey. So back in the 6th century BC, they were the first to make coins. So a coin allowed you to have a means of exchange that was a set denomination, a set amount within a coin. All right, so if you're going to use gold as money, you want to be able to make coins out of it. Uh, China used gold and silver, uh, probably more silver in their coinage, and China was the first uh, country in history to create paper money. So you can trace all of our uh, financial woes, if you got them, to China creating paper money. And I would call that paper currency instead of paper money. Uh, the Greeks made jewelry and coins, the Romans now Historically, uh, citizens of countries didn't like to give their tax money to the government for war. They didn't like the idea of giving gold or silver in order to kill other people. All right? So as the Roman Empire was in its process of collapsing and the emperor needed to pay the troops in gold and silver, there was no gold and silver coming in. So he started adding copper to the coinage. And copper is a base metal. And eventually, by the fall of the Roman Empire, there was no gold and silver in the coins. They were all bronze. And adding base metal to your, your coinage is known as debasing your, your currency. And you hear that term today when we talk about what's, what's happening in the US as well. But that's where it came from. You're debasing, adding base metal. Now, the European countries, you know, uh, Spain, uh, uh, Great Britain, Portugal, as they were conquering other lands, they were taking the gold, right? Uh, Columbus, when he was uh, looking for the West Indies, he landed in North America and he went to Central and South America. He was looking for gold. He was financed to go find gold. He ended up finding a lot of silver. And still today, most of the world's silver comes from Central and South America. Mexico is the biggest exporter of silver. And then um, the British created the, uh, the pound and the Spanish had the real. So before we became the United States, and we had our own coinage, 
the colonists used primarily the Sp British pound and the Spanish real. And the Spanish real was also known as pieces of eight, if you've ever heard that term. Because we didn't have dimes, quarters, and half dollars back then. So you'd take a piece of eight, a real, and clip it into these little pie wedges to make a dime, to make a quarter. All right, so another term was uh, pieces of eight. All right, so this is most of the presentations about the history of gold and silver in the United States and its history as money, okay? So in uh, 1784, Thomas Jefferson sat down and wrote what became the Coinage Act of 1792. And in the Coinage Act, Thomas Jefferson said only gold and silver minted by the states would be used as money. All right, so he defined how many grains of silver would be in a silver dollar and how many grains of gold would be in an eagle, which is a $10 gold coin. Now, Jefferson and the founders knew that the downfall of countries had to do with the creation, governments creating paper money or debasing their, their coinage. So he said that everything other than gold and silver is counterfeit, and you could actually be put to death for counterfeiting. And today, everything in your pocket is counterfeit. So, but going back to our founder, Jefferson, uh, he said that only gold and silver would be money. Uh, they knew that, that free men would only use these precious metals in, as a means of exchange. And in the silver dollar, there's about three quarters of a troy ounce of silver, all right? And in the gold eagle, there was very close to a half ounce of gold. So a double eagle, a $20 gold coin, had almost an ounce of gold, all right? If you took 20 silver dollars to make one eagle, you'd multiply 20 times 3 quarters, you get 15 ounces, all right? So in the Constitution, the silver to gold ratio was 15 to 1. 15 ounces of silver for every one ounce of gold. And remember I said that there's 9 ounces. They thought there was 15 ounces coming out of the ground to every one ounce of gold. All right, so we started with a 15 to 1 silver to gold ratio. 1776 comes around, uh, Washington needs to pay the troops, colonies weren't paying any taxes. The reason we were in the Revolutionary War is we were paying taxes to the, to the British, but so there was no tax money coming in from the colonists. So he printed what, uh, what was called the Continental Dollar, a piece of paper currency to pay the troops to fight the British. And like all paper currency, the value of the Continental went down to zero very quickly. So there was a phrase that came out of this called not worth the Continental. So when you look at something and you call it worthless, there was like the slang, you know, you'd call it not worth the continental. So that's where that came from. Now, Alexander Hamilton, another one of our founders, uh, he actually went against the Constitution pretty much out of the gate. And he became the first banker of the United States and created the first bank of the U.S. to print paper currency. And that charter ran out in 1811. So then we went back to the Constitution, which said only gold and silver would be money. Then in 1816, the second bank of the U.S. was created. And in the 1830s, Andrew Jackson ran as president on the platform that he was going to get us back to the Constitution, get rid of paper currency printed by the government or sanctioned by the government with the, the second bank. And in 1836, he actually abolished the second bank of the U.S. All right. After that, for, uh, you know, uh, Less, less than 100 years, but for many years after that, when you had paper currency, it was issued by the bank as a receipt against the gold you deposited there. So think about a bank as a place to deposit your gold. It's your gold storage facility. When they gave you paper printed by the bank, it was a receipt that you could go back and retrieve your gold. And if you gave someone that, that receipt, they could go retrieve your gold from that bank. So think about paper currency at that point once the second bank was killed, were receipts to go claim the gold in the bank. 1848, gold was found in, in California. And in 1849, about 300,000 guys moved west, and they were known as the 49ers. Those are the guys who went out there to, to, to stake their claim and get all the gold. And the San Francisco football team got their name from all those gold prospectors going to California. Now, in 1861, we're in the Civil War. And Lincoln needed to pay the troops. Again, nobody wants to send in tax money. We didn't have income tax. Nobody wanted to give tax money to fight wars. So uh, Lincoln had the greenback dollar printed to pay the troops. And just like the Continental, the greenback went to its intrinsic value of zero very rapidly. Now, has every, anybody ever seen the movie Wizard of Oz? No, no only, only a couple. 
All right, so Wizard of Oz was the first uh, color movie, right? Technicolor, when you watch it. And uh, in the movie, does anybody remember what color Dorothy's slippers were? Ruby red. All right, so does anybody who read the book, The Wonderful Wizard of Oz, know what color, color her slippers were in the book? Silver. There we go. All right, so L. Frank Baum, who wrote The Wonderful Wizard of Oz, good guess. Ah, you knew. You just read it before you came here. All right. So Al Frank Baum wrote this book in 1900. He was known as, uh, he was, this is all political satire. Uh, just like Gulliver's Travels, if you remember, it's all political satire. That's what the Wizard of Oz was, political satire about the times. Uh, Al Frank Baum believed in the Constitution and the bimetallic system of gold and silver's money. So the golden, um, uh, the uh, yellow brick road represented gold. The silver slippers represented silver working together as the money of the United States. Uh, the scarecrow represented farmers who all the crooked politicians thought were stupid. So remember the farmer, uh, the scarecrow had no brain, but the scarecrow came up with all the good ideas, if you remember. Uh, the tin man represented the industrial revolution and factories, right? Uh, that was all in the early 1900s, late 1800s. And the oil can represented Rockefeller. So Rockefeller had a monopoly, a stranglehold on the oil industry, right? And the factories couldn't run without oil, so the Tin Man couldn't walk without oil. Uh, the Cowardly Lion was um, uh, a politician back then, William Jennings Bryan, who believed in the free silver uh, movement. He ran, I think, twice for president, lost. Uh, Oz is short for ounces. The Wizard, the Wizard of Ounces, was a crooked politician. And the Emerald City represented the gold counterfeit currency the greenback printed money, where the crooked politician lived. So this book was all about gold and silver and what was happening. They ruined the book with the movie with the ruby slippers, made no sense, right? But it looked good in Technicolor, so. Now, has anybody ever heard of the Titanic? Okay, so Titanic, the unsinkable ship, right? Uh, sailed only one time in 1912. Well, before the Titanic sailed in 1910, there were six bankers and a senator from New York that met on an island off the coast of uh, Georgia called Jekyll Island. And what was going on back then? Well, the bankers, as always, wanted to control the money. They wanted to control the gold. And they wanted to come up with a plan to make that happen so what did they do? They devised the third bank of the U.S. when they met on Jekyll Island. Now, at that uh, meeting, there was Paul Warburg, who represented the Rothschild family, the evil Rothschild family that still today owns most of the central banks across the world. J.P. Morgan was not there, but he had a proxy there. Rockefeller wasn't there, but he had someone there representing him as well. So these guys devised the third bank of the U.S., and uh, they didn't call it that, all right? They called it something else. Now, they came up with that in 1910. The Titanic was financed by J.P. Morgan. So J.P. Morgan owned the Titanic, and he was supposed to be there for that maiden voyage. For some reason, he didn't show up. He also bought a lot of art in Europe that he decided not to load on the ship for some strange reason. Now, also, guy didn't show up was Vanderbilt. He was supposed to be on the maiden voyage. I don't know how, do you know that Anderson Cooper is Gloria Vanderbilt's son? Okay, so the Vanderbilt family. Now, three guys who did show up on the Titanic were Guggenheim, Strauss, and Astor. These are three of the most wealthy men in the United States. All three believed in the Constitution. All three were against the rumors they heard of someone wanting to create a uh, central bank in the United States. All three went down on the ship. So the theory is that uh, Rothschild, J.P. Morgan, put a bomb in the bottom of the ship, and that exploded and sunk it. There's another theory. This is a good one. Uh, the captain of the ship was a Freemason and was instructed to steer north where all the icebergs were, basically committing suicide. So after the ship sunk in 1912, Woodrow Wilson passed the Federal Reserve Act and created the IRS. So they didn't want to call the third bank of the US third bank. The other two had failed. So they called it the Federal Reserve. And it's not federal. It's a private cabal of bankers 
who own the Federal Reserve, who have the, uh, the right to print paper currency. We outsource the printing of our paper to the Federal Reserve, who could then loan it to the banks that they controlled. And the Internal Revenue Service was created so they can tax the people, so they could pay the interest on the counterfeit money currency that the Federal Reserve created. So that all happened in 1913 when Woodrow Wilson passed the Federal Reserve Act. All right, so what does that have to do with gold? We still had gold coins. We still had silver coins. Uh, so they didn't abolish gold, but we outsourced the printing of the paper so these bankers could control the currency. All right, passed in 1913, right? Now, one of the reasons that this got passed, or at least the bankers told the public, was we want to avoid runs on the bank, okay? What is a run on the bank? Well, when the bank doesn't have enough money in its, in its coffers, and the people who deposited there, right? So you remember the uh, Bailey Building and Loan? They all came running in, because they heard that you know everybody needed their money, they needed their currency out of the bank. So if you think your bank is making bad investments, you want to go there to get your money out of there. But all banks practice fractional reserve lending, which meant when you deposited your you know, $1,000 in the bank, they would loan out $900. So George Bailey did not have that $1,000 sitting in the bank because they had loaned it out to Joe's place and Frank's place, probably set, get Martini's house. They might have even given a commercial loan on Martini's, you know, built, you know, his bar building, which, you know, commercial lending is, is even worse now than private lending. So the, the Fed got its approval based on preventing runs, but this was the Great Depression. That's when the biggest runs on banks happened. So they regulated the banks. They lent money from the Federal Reserve to the banks to try to curb runs on the banks. We got even more runs on the banks. Now in 1933, we're in the Great Depression. FDR, thinking that the way to get out of a depression is to create government programs, spend money, hire a bunch of people to be government workers. What did he do? He outlawed gold. So this is the executive order outlawing gold coins. He actually put uh, federal marshals in safety deposit box rooms at banks to take your gold coins. So he, he didn't, it wasn't truly a confiscation because he gave you a $20 bill piece of paper printed by the Fed for your $20 gold coin. But in 1934, after he'd collected as many gold coins as he could, he revalued gold from $20 an ounce, where it had been since 1792, to $35 an ounce. So now he had that $15 delta to spend on all those government programs. So FDR outlawed gold. All right, so from 1937 to 1971, we had what was called a gold standard, meaning the printed paper currency was backed by gold in Fort Knox. But as an American citizen, you could not own gold coins. But your paper, they told you, was worth so much because it's as good as gold. It's backed by gold. Now, in 1944, we're in uh, World War II. Uh, Germany is blowing up a big chunk of Europe and taking gold from different countries. Russia's blowing up the other part of Europe and taking gold. So we had a conference here in Bretton Woods, New Hampshire in 1944. The Allied countries sent representation. This is a picture from it. This guy's sleeping right here. That's John Maynard Keynes. So he came from Britain. If you've heard of Keynesian economics, this is the guy. And he came here. And in 1944, there was an agreement called the Bretton Woods Agreement that made the dollar the reserve currency of the world. All right? What did that mean? That meant that whenever you have international trade between countries, you needed to convert your local currency to US dollars. And they did that through the use of bonds and different mechanisms, okay? But that allowed you to have a, a set currency as a means of exchange between nations, all right? And why did they do that? Because the dollar was as good as gold. It was backed by gold in Fort Knox. And all these countries sent us their gold for safekeeping. All right? So France sent us their gold. Uh, South American countries sent us their gold. England sent us gold. And we said, hey, you can call us anytime, get your gold back. But for now, World War II, we want to keep it safe. Nobody's blowing up the United States. So in 1944, the US dollar became the world's reserve currency. All right, so repatriation would be where you can call us up and you can get your gold back. Well, Charles de Gaulle gave us a call, 
And what happened? The CIA was sent over to assassinate him. So right after he was almost shot, he hung up the phone, said, keep my gold. Don't worry about it. We'll keep using your dollar. But a lot of countries wanted to repatriate their gold because the United States was printing lots of paper currency, spending, the government was spending a lot, going deeper into debt. They wanted to get their gold back because the dollar wasn't necessarily as stable as we had promised to them. All right, in 1963, JFK issued an executive order, 111110, uh, and this executive order was to create uh, silver certificates. Because at that point, printed paper from the Fed was backed by gold. JFK wanted it to be gold and silver, right? We had silver coins, but he wanted it to be backed by, and he wanted to keep silver in the coinage. Now, shortly after this was passed, he was killed by the CIA, which came out fairly recently, and nobody's all uptight about it, but it used to be you're called a conspiracy theorist when you said the CIA killed Kennedy. Well, finally came out that yes, the CIA was involved in his assassination. Was it because of silver? That's one of the reasons. Cuba, there's all kinds of reasons that the bank, the CIA, financed uh, by the bank, wanted to kill Kennedy. But shortly after Kennedy was killed, in 1964, his face was put on the half dollar, right? 1964 was the last year we had 90% silver coins. So in 1965, your dimes and quarters had zero silver, and from 65 through 70, half dollars were 40% silver. Now we're still on a gold standard, but just like banks had fractional reserve lending, we had a fractional reserve gold standard. So by 1971, there was about 10% of the global dollars that are, are all out there backed by gold in Fort Knox. So call that a fractional gold reserve standard. And everybody wanted their gold back. So Nixon, and this is because we were, we'd created a lot of social programs, right? We had Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid, public aid, public housing, FDA, FDIC, EPA, all these programs coming out of, the, out of Washington. So we were spending and spending and printing and printing and not gold backing up all that printing. So in 1971, everybody wanted their gold back. So what did Nixon do? He said, temporarily, we're going to go off the gold standard. And he closed the ability for countries to repatriate their gold. And we are still temporarily off the gold standard, 52 years later. All right, so what's a hot topic? Inflation. All right, so uh, when it comes to economics, I don't personally like John Maynard Keynes or Keynesian economics, like a lot of our kids and grandkids are learning in college. I like these guys. These are the Austrian school of economics you know, guys who founded the Austrian school. And it's not because Austria followed their teachings. It's because most of these guys escaped Austria to come here. So you had Menger and von Mises and Hayek. All these guys came from Austria. Now, they defined inflation a little bit different than we all are taught, right? We think inflation means the increase of prices. Well, they said inflation is the inflation of the monetary base. So the inflation of the supply of paper currency. And when you have more of something, it's worth less. Now everything's more expensive. So the inflation of the m currency leads to higher prices. So it's a little bit different way to look at the term inflation. Now, uh, after 1971, when we went off the gold standard, inflation, the printing of paper currency, increased by 4%. Back then, that was seen as huge. Right? Economists are all like, oh my God, they were freaking out that we increased it by 4%. So Paul Volcker came in as the Federal uh, Reserve Chairman, and he raised the federal funds rate. So that's the rate that banks could borrow that printed paper currency from the bank, from the central bank. He raised that rate to 18%. So if any of you were trying to buy a house in 1980, you had a 20% mortgage. So everybody had to get real creative in how to buy a house back then, right? So 20%, can you imagine? But if you wanted to buy a treasury bond from the government, you got 15%. So you actually made real money on that, right? So what was the reason? Volcker was trying to pull in all that paper currency that flooded the world to save the dollar from collapsing. And gold in 1980 rose to $800, right? So after uh, FDR took us off of gold, it was 35 bucks an ounce. Uh, it went all the way up to 42 an ounce, and then when Volcker raised interest rates, uh, well, before that, 
1980, gold went to 800 an ounce. So from 42 to 800, so 2,000% increase. Silver went from a dollar to $50 in 1980 per ounce. When Volcker raised interest rates, gold went from 800 back down to 250, and silver went from 50 down to five. So by doing this, pulling in all that liquidity, he was able to collapse or bring down the, the value of gold. Because gold, you can look at it as the inverse of the dollar. As the dollar goes down in value, gold goes up. But really, gold is stable. Gold is stable. All right, so after Volcker, we had Greenspan, Bernanke, Yellen, Powell. They inflated the monetary base by 400%. Forget about this 4%, but they increased the debt. So you can go onto the US debt clock. When I did the screen capture a couple days ago, the debt is at right around 33 trillion. Trillion used to be like a made up word, right? Now it's like, oh, it prints a trillion there, trillion there. Now they're talking quadrillion. I was with someone the other day, they said there's a term called vagajillion. I don't know if that's like, you know, a billion trillion. I don't know, it sounds kind of crazy, but yeah, 33 trillion in debt. So if we raised interest rates even to 10%, and all of this debt held by the treasury, if they had to pay 10% on short-term bonds, that's 3.3 trillion of debt service alone. They can't collect that from us. So they can't raise rates to protect the dollar because we have so much debt. Back then, we only had about a trillion of debt. All right, so not to scare you too much, but my thinking is we need to get back to gold. See, people don't send gold to the government to spend like crazy. You can't do deficit spending, spending on programs without money in the coffers if it's all based on gold. So the answer, from my standpoint, is the Constitution, putting those golden handcuffs back on our government, getting us back to gold as money. And the gold standard isn't good enough, right, because it was fractional. So even when we had the gold standard, the value of the currency went down and gold went up because it was only fractional. But if we had gold coins in our pocket, see, from 1792 to 1933, when we had gold coins, gold was $20 an ounce. 1792 to 1933. So that's 150 years. So in a gold-based system, you actually have natural deflation. Prices of goods go down, right? You have automation, you have the industrial revolution. So if we were using gold coins, we wouldn't have price increases. We'd actually have decrease of prices. Everything, you got automation, things get easier. But once we went off of gold, we've got some problems. All right, so here's the value of the dollar since 1913. So that's the purchasing power. So what cost you two cents in 1913 now costs you a dollar. We've devalued the currency by 98% since the founding of the Fed. Here's gold. So here's that stable gold. Gold is stable. Gold never changes value. It's only the value of the currency that goes up and down. Gold never changes its value. But here you see what happened. This is where FDR outlawed gold, right? This is 1980, this is 2011. So as the currency, the printed paper counterfeit goes down, gold goes up, it's the inverse. So back in 1964, gas was 25 cents a gallon. Now if you brought me a silver quarter today for me to buy, I'd pay about $4, $4.50 for it. So gas, same price in terms of silver. A Hershey bar was 10 cents. Today, if you brought me a dime, a silver dime, 64 dime, I'd pay you two bucks. You get two Hershey bars, right? Because Hershey's got automation, they've got you know, uh, assembly lines, they're making chocolate you know, better, more efficient. So the cost of the Hershey bar is way cheaper now. You can get two, two Hershey bars for 10 cents if it was silver. All right, so who are some of the villains of gold? All right, well, I have Alexander Hamilton up here. Now, Hamilton believed in gold, but he also believed in creating a central bank and printed currency. Now, my mom's here, so I usually make this joke, so we'll see if it goes over. So another reason Hamilton's a villain is my mom went to see this play, and now she likes rap music. So there's, <laughs> but it's not necessarily true, but she did like the play Hamilton. Now, interesting, if you think about the Hamilton, the play, who was the hero? Hamilton. Who was the villain? Jefferson. Who financed this stupid play? The banks. 
So they want the banker to be the hero and the freedom fighter, the gold guy, to be the villain. Woodrow Wilson, who uh, passed the Federal Reserve Act, created the IRS, right, with these creatures from Jekyll Island. Again, Rothschild wasn't there, Wahlberg was there, J.P. Morgan, Rockefeller were not there, but they all had people there representing them. And this book, by the way, is phenomenal. I just, I flashed it before. It's about 700 pages, and it goes into way more detail than this presentation on the history of money, the history of gold, the history of the United States. Uh, it's phenomenal. And G. Edward Griffin, who wrote it, is still doing interviews today. He's like 95 or something. Brilliant guy. Wrote that book. Now, FDR made gold illegal. LBJ took silver out of our currency, right? Killed Kennedy, along with the CIA, along with George Bush on the grassy knoll. Uh, Richard Nixon took us off the gold standard, temporarily. John Maynard Keynes, he called gold a barbarous relic. And he said, that doesn't matter, because eventually you die. Well, he died before the poop hit the fan, which still has not fully happened. But yeah, he believed in government going into debt and financing programs to stimulate the economy. All right? Ben Bernanke, who represents all Fed chairmen, uh, he, uh, Ron Paul was at a uh, hearing, and he asked uh, Ben Bernanke, why do central banks across the world still buy gold and silver? He said tradition, right? Well, they do it because they don't want their fiat currencies to be viewed as unstable, so the central banks across the globe buy gold and silver. J.P. Morgan, gold is money, everything else is credit. So J.P. Morgan knew that gold is the only money and silver, but usually you group it together. Everything else is credit or debt. Okay, so these are some of the enemies of gold. Now, who are some of the heroes? Well, Thomas Jefferson, he knew that freedom, free men, liberty, you need money that is market-based, that's not controlled by bankers. He wrote the coinage act. Andrew Jackson, who killed the second bank of the U.S. L. Frank Baum, who wrote The Wizard of Oz. Ludwig von Mises, uh, really the, the main founder of the Austrian School of Economics, and then Ayn Rand, who uh, she learned her economics from the Austrians, and she wrote Atlas Shrugged back in 1957. And if you go to four, page 417, there's a whole speech on gold. And then if any of you read this, hopefully you read it and didn't see that terrible mu movie they made, made out of it. But in the land where everybody escaped in this future world, they used gold as a means of exchange. She wrote this in 57, so we didn't have gold coins. So she had gold coins, gold bars as money in this book. So she was a big believer in gold and silver, just like all the Austrian economists. JFK, who was trying to take on the central bank, made uh, silver certificates. You know, CIA took him out for many reasons, but probably the primary one was he was combating the bank, right? If you keep silver and gold with the people, you don't need that central bank. Uh, Alan Greenspan. Now, I have a question mark above his head. Alan Greenspan used to hang out with Ayn Rand back in the 50s when she was writing, writing Atlas Shrugged. He was getting his uh, MBA at Columbia. And in 1967, he wrote an article for her newsletter uh, all about gold as money. Again, not the gold standard, not gold housed somewhere and you're using paper, gold as money. But then he became head of the Fed. He was appointed by Gerald Ford, and he kept interest rates artificially low, which the, federal, the central bank has the ability to do, and he printed a lot of paper currency. So a theory is that A, he's a traitor to his original ideals, or B, he's a hero who is trying to kill the dollar to get us back to gold. Now there's another theory that he is Satoshi Nokomoto. Satoshi Nokomoto wrote the white paper on Bitcoin in 2008. So if any of you are into Bitcoin or hear about this crazy thing called Bitcoin, there is a theory that he is the guy who wrote the white paper on Bitcoin. Again, it's the central bank killer. Bitcoin, just like gold, can be used between individuals as a means of exchange without having a bank in the way, without having the government in the way. So could be just a theory, but it's one I hear. Ron Paul, uh, he was a Republican, but more of a libertarian, a follower of uh, Ayn Rand. His son is named Rand. A uh, big believer in gold and silver, just like all libertarians who believe in the Constitution. Now, we had a recent president. I don't, I don't put his face up here. Some people don't like him. But he had golden hair, golden toilets, golden chandeliers, golden paint, golden logo. 
The first thing he did when he uh, won is put Andrew Jackson's portrait up in the Oval Office. So there's a theory that whoever this guy was or is, is taking on the central bank like Kennedy. Your call, you know. Uh, so what are some of the terms for gold? Well, gold is God's money, right? Hard money, it's, it's, it's got you know, physicality to it, honest money. That's why the Je Jefferson and the Austrians believe in it, it's honest. You know, an ounce of gold, whether it's here or in Japan or in uh, Brazil, it's worth the same amount. It's an ounce of gold, right? It's transactionable that way. It's real money instead of that fake stuff they print and they put different num zeros on it, right? You got a $10 bill, a $100 bill, a $1,000 bill, what makes it worth more? Just the zero they printed on it? Uh, it's the commodity, right? It's a commodity just like, you know, wood or water or oil. It's the commodity of money. And it's easier to use as a means of exchange than water or salt or wood. So it's the commodity of money. And it's constitutional money. It's in the law of the land. So unless I'm mistaken, the United States, the law of the land is still the Constitution. So if we ever get back to the law of the land, that would mean gold and silver is money. So again, J.P. Morgan, he understood that. That's why he wanted to control all the gold, right? Ludwig von Mises. So there's a difference between currency and money. And there's a lot of stuff that was used as currency throughout history. Salt, shells, rocks, beaver pelts in Colorado, tulip bulbs, right? There was that big tulip bulb inflation. Uh, tally sticks in England is kind of a cool idea. So currency and money are means of exchange, unit of account. They're durable. They're supposed to be durable. Uh, they're divisible. You can separate them by uh, you know, amounts. So you can have a quarter, a dime, a $1 bill, a $5 bill. They're portable. You can carry them with you. They're fungible, meaning they're interchangeable with each other. But the big difference between currency and money is store of value. So if in 1913 you'd buried five $20 gold coins in your backyard, so $100 of gold, and you buried $1 bills in your backyard, if you dug it up today, assuming that worms didn't eat those $100 bills, they're still only worth 100 bucks. But those five $20 gold coins are worth $10,000. So money is a store of value whereas currency is not. All right, so pre now if you go home tonight uh, and you're looking at your piggy bank and you're looking at your change, you're looking for pre-1965 dimes, quarters, halves, and silver dollars. Uh, silver dollars we stopped making in 1935. We started making them again in 71 with Eisenhower on them. They were not silver. So pre-65, so 64 and before, dimes, quarters, and halves were 90% silver, 10% copper. Now, half dollars between 65 and 70 were 40% silver. And I don't know what kind of crazy joke LBJ was playing, you know, in regards to Kennedy, but your half dollars, when you see them from 65 through 70, are 40% silver instead of 90% silver. Gold coins, so two and a half, five, ten, twenty dollar gold coins, were 90% gold and 10% copper. And we had those again up until 1933. Today, if you're an investor in gold or silver, you're probably buying a gold eagle or a silver eagle. Those are 100% gold, 100% silver, all right? Uh, and I could, you know, review this as we go. Now, if you look at an old $20 bill when we had gold coins, it says, in gold coin payable to the bearer on demand. That's a, before 1933, that's what your $20 bill said. Since then, it says Federal Reserve note. So a note means debt. So we have a debt-based monetary system. The system only works the deeper we go into debt, unfortunately. We're now 33 trillion in debt. It cannot stop. It's gonna keep increasing because a debt-based system is kind of like a Ponzi scheme. It's only as good as you can keep debt going. So now you're gonna hear about stimulus packages of five trillion, right? Six trillion. They'll lock us up with COVID again and they'll print 10 trillion. So the debt-based system will only last as long as people are willing to take this counterfeit. So it's a confidence game, it's a con game, but we're still playing it. And vendors still take your, your paper currency, right? But it is a, a note. So because you have a $20 bill in your pocket, you owe the Federal Reserve 20 bucks plus interest. Whereas you used to be able to go get a $20 gold coin. 
So it's not all bad news. I'll share some uh, positive stuff. So this is the, the latest $100 bill. It's been around for, uh, I think, 10 years or so. The left side says Federal Reserve note. You got Franklin looking very dour, kind of pissed off, right? It's black and white over there. So the left side of the $100 bill represents the Fed, debt, slavery, right? Hayek wrote the road to serfdom. It represents serfdom. It's basically the corrupt side of the $100 bill. But then you got this nice bright blue line, right? Like blue skies are here again. On this side, it's all gold. So here you've got the Declaration of Independence. You've got a golden ink well. You've got the Liberty Bell. So one theory is the $100 bill represents us going back to gold as money. It's also used to be the $100 bill is the most counterfeited bill in the world, so this is all kinds of counterfeit protection. <laughs> but that is a theory that it's saying we're going back to gold. All right, so that's enough on money. So what are some of the other uses of gold and silver? Well, I went into the great detail on coins and money, but gold and silver are used for awards, right? You get the uh, gold, gold, silver, and bronze uh, Olympic medals. The first Olympics back in 1910, that actually was a gold coin. Since then, it's just been a gold plated. But the silver has been silver ever since then. So if you've got grandkids who are in the Olympics, have them go for second place because that's worth more than the gold. And bronze is worth crap, so you know, if they get third place, just tell them, don't even take the award. Uh, the Oscar is gold, right? He's gold plated. Military medals, a lot of them are silver. Uh, dental, now gold is great for dental. It doesn't degrade. It's soft, so you can mold it around a tooth. It's malleable, it won't, you know, it won't chip the tooth above it. So it was used for crowns, bridges, fillings, uh, even old dentures. I bought a lot of dentures, well not a lot, I bought a few dentures over the past 10 years, solid gold. So gold doesn't degrade. Now silver, they ended up mixing silver with mercury and hurt our teeth. So silver was not so good for the teeth. So you don't find dentists using silver at all anymore and some are still using gold. Uh, art and religious items, but the biggest use of gold and silver is jewelry. Now the other thing is con uh, conducting electricity. Gold and silver are the best conductors of electricity. And from what I understand, gold is actually slightly better than silver. But imagine using uh, gold as your conductor in, in all the uh, usage. So when we look at silver, silver is actually the most useful of all metals. It's used in flatware, candlesticks, um, picture frames, lighters. There's all kinds of things. When we used to develop photos in a dark room, we were using silver. X-rays, the black part of a printed X-ray is silver. Silver is, uh, again, second to gold, but the most common best use is for conducting electricity. So a nuclear plant uses uh, just tons of silver. Every solar panel has one to four ounces of silver in it because it's such a good conductor of electricity. Batteries, one of the most important uses going forward for silver is in batteries. So something tells me Elon Musk either owns a silver mine, owns tons of silver, he needs silver for his batteries, for his cars, all the electrical components. Uh, silver used to be used for mirrors since it's the most reflective element known to man. You'd have a layer of silver and then a layer of glass and that was a mirror. And today it's aluminum. It'd be too expensive to make mirrors with silver. Silver also is antibacterial. So water filtration, Silver is used for water filtration, medical devices, bandages after surgery. Uh, Under Armour brags about having silver woven in their clothes because it's antibacterial, so supposedly you won't smell as much when you wear Under Armour. Uh, and it's also used for electrical contacts. If you go into old industrial buildings and you go to the electrical panel, the contacts are all silver. So, but the biggie is renewable energy. That's the biggie, and that's where silver is going to get all used up. So I just heard a, a broadcast yesterday that uh, very soon we're going to be using about 500 million ounces of silver for solar panels. And there's less than 2 billion ounces mined every year. And that's, you know, going up and down. And mining has become too expensive with silver prices suppressed. It's not affordable for anybody to mine silver. But they're going to use it. Uh, solar is the biggest use. All right, so I've got a whole class that I do on how to identify your own gold and silver, but I'll, I give kind of an overview. So the first thing you want to do is get a very powerful magnet. Gold and silver do not stick to a magnet. They shouldn't. So if you have stuff that does, it's because it's mixed with other stuff that does. Uh, so here are two gold chains. You can see this one is sticking to the magnet, so I know that that one is gold-plated, gold-filled, but it is not gold. 
This one is not sticking. You see the gap with the magnet? Now, that doesn't guarantee it is gold, but it means you've got a fighting chance that that chain is gold. All right? Here's two earrings. This one's not sticking. This one is. Now, if you have an earring with a silver post, it's not gold. So any high-quality earring is going to have a gold post in it. All right? But it's also going to stick to a magnet pretty strongly, more than likely, if it's not gold. Now, more important than a uh, magnet is a magnifying glass or a loop. All right, so what are you looking for on your items? Well, let's talk about gold first. So you're looking for 10K, 14K, 18K, 22K. What does this carrot thing mean? Well, go back to high school or grade school fractions. All right, now we've got to go even way back. The denominator in gold is 24, all right? So 24 divided by 24 is 100%. So 24 karat gold is 100% gold, right? So think about the denominator being 24. So 10 karat gold, 10 divided by 24, gives you 0.417 or 41.7% gold. 14 karat, which is the most common, if you divide 14 by 24, you get 0.585 or 58.5%. Now, if you actually pull out your iPhone and did this, you would actually get 0.583 and a whole bunch of numbers after that. So for whatever reason, we label our jewelry 585, but if you have jewelry from Poland or Czechoslovakia or Russia, a lot of it is labeled 583. So 583 or 585 is the same as 14 carat. All right? 18 carat, if you divide 18 by 24, you get 0.75. So 18 carat gold, is 75% gold, so you're gonna see either 750 or 18K. Now, white gold has the same percent of gold as yellow gold. Don't let anybody tell you that white gold means it's you know, less valuable. It's the same value. There's a process of mixing gold with nickel to create silver gold throughout. So white gold is the same percent as yellow gold. So if you see 750 or 18K or 585 or 14K on white gold, same percent of gold, all right? If you know anybody from India and they've got that very yellow looking gold and it looks almost fake, it's not fake. It's 22 karat gold, it's really good stuff. So that's 91.7% gold. And coming out of Asia, you know, China and South Korea, I've bought you know, many 24 karat pieces. But that's, very, that's not very common. So there is 24 karat jewelry out there. Um, but this kind of gives you an idea. Now, dental gold, if you've got a crown laying around, you've got a tooth yanked, make sure you get it back from your dentist. Uh, it's usually 16 karat, which is six, you know, two-thirds gold. So it's better than most jewelry. So I buy a lot of dental gold, uh, but it's not marked. The dentist does not stamp 16K on your tooth. So don't look for a mark on it. All right, silver is trickier than gold. So sterling silver is 92.5% silver, 7.5% copper. I forgot to mention with gold, when it's 58% gold, the other 42% is silver, tin, copper, nickel, other base metals. Uh, so when you're looking at jewelry, a lot of times you'll see the number 925. 925 parts per thousand are silver. That's sterling, all right? So you're looking on your flatware or your other pieces, you want to see that word sterling. That's the key to you know, a lot of items now. In 1871, Grant made it uh, a law that if you imported silver to the United States, it needed to be stamped sterling. But if you bought silver in other countries, like in England, and you were staying in England, you're looking for different hallmarks. The main thing you want to see is this lion. So you see that lion, that full, he's known as the walking lion? That means sterling. Sometimes he's looking straight ahead, sometimes he's looking at you. Uh, the lion's a little bit different, whether it's Denmark versus England versus some other countries, but you want to see that lion. That means sterling. You also want to see a panther head. So here's a panther. Here's a panther with a crown. That also means sterling. You might want to see a king or a queen. You always had to put the king or queen in England on when you're, when you're the maker. You had to put their image on that sterling. Now this other hallmark that you see, the letter. So you see an I, capital I, in this shape. You see a Q over here in a circle. You see a, you know, a cursive T. That tells you the year. So every silversmith in London in 1852 needed to use that T, that font style in that you know, Pac-Man shape. The next year, 1853, he needed to use a U in the same font style in that same shape. 
And it didn't always go through the entire alphabet, but you can look on the internet to try to find out how old your items are based on that letter in that shape. All right. Uh, you might see numbers on your silver. So if you have silver from Germany, a lot of times it'll say 800. That means 800 parts per thousand silver. So it's not as good as sterling, but it's still 80% instead of 92%, right? You might see 813H, which is from Finland. You might see 835, you might see 900. 900 is also known as coin silver, right? The old coins were 90% silver. 900 means nine, 900 parts per thousand, 90% silver. Now, if you see EP, this is the bad news. EP means electroplated. EP and S is electroplated nickel silver. EPBM is electroplated base metal. A1, silver over copper. Community, triple plated, quadruple plated, doesn't matter how much plating, it's still plated. So a set of flatware that's sterling, that you know, service for 12, is gonna be somewhere between $1,000 to $1,500 based on silver price today. That same service for 12 that's plated is worth about $10. So you want the sterling. Plated kind of stinks. But it's still, it's a very thin layer over a base metal, a thin layer of silver, so it is some silver. My refinery still buys it, but it's just a mere fraction of the value of sterling. All right. Now, if you've got some of these, these old candlestick holders that none of the kids or grandkids, they definitely don't want these things. Uh, you flip them over, if it says sterling weighted or sterling reinforced, that means you've got a very thin, almost aluminum foil layer of sterling around a chunk of cement. All right, that's what sterling weighted means. So here I weigh one of those candlesticks, it's 9.3 ounces. I take out a tool and I strip off all that silver. See how it's like that, it's almost like aluminum foil, but it's, it's stronger and it cuts you. I've got lots of scars and lots of bleeding, lots of swearing that my wife hears. And then when you weigh the scrap, it's now about an ounce. So when I buy these, I usually factor somewhere between 10 and 15% of the weight is sterling. I don't take this apart in front of you. I don't want, don't want to see grown people cry, so I do this back at the shop. But yeah, it's, you know, when it says sterling weighted, it's sterling. It's just there's a lot of weighting in it that takes up the most of it. All right, so just a couple more slides. Um, where did I learn a lot of the stuff? Well, these are the type of guys who talk about gold. Peter Schiff, Ron Paul, Bix Ware, Robert Kiyosaki, Rick Rule. I mean, I could talk to you about all these guys, and you can look them up on YouTube. G. Edward Griffin, who wrote um, Creature from Jekyll Island. Jim Willie, I like him a lot. So Keith Newmeyer runs a big uh, uh, silver mining company. Rick Rule, who uh, works for Eric Sprott up in Canada. Now, you're also hearing talk about BRICS, right? The BRICS countries, they met a couple weeks ago. Before they met, there was a big rumor that they were going to back a new currency with gold. Now, it didn't happen, but it was a big rumor in the rumor mill. BRICS stands for Brazil, Russia, India, China, South Africa. Now, something I should have put up here, there were two countries that joined the BRICS at this conference two weeks ago. One was Saudi Arabia. One was the United Arab Emirates, the other one, all right? After Nixon took us off the gold standard in 71, the dollar became known as the petrodollar. Why was that? It was still the reserve currency. The most, um, uh, you know, the biggest market between nations of trade was oil, or still is oil. So if you needed to use dollars to buy oil, right, for international trade, that's why they called it the petrodollar. So we told Saudi Arabia, and UAE and the other uh, OPEC nations, hey, we will protect your ships going through the Suez Canal, we'll pr protect your refineries, we'll go to war with anybody in the Middle East, which we have done, as long as you keep taking dollars for oil. That's why it was called the petrodollar. But if Saudi Arabia and the, UA, you know, the Arab Emirates joined the BRICS, and now they're willing to take Russian rubles and Chinese yuan for oil, which they are, even though the BRICS don't, don't have a currency yet, the dollar is no longer truly the full reserve currency of the world. It's used for now right around 50% of international trade. It used to be 100%. All right, so why do people buy gold and silver? Well, it's a hedge against the inflation of the currency, right? So if there's more and more printed paper currency it should be going down in value. Gold never changes its value, but it looks like it's going up as the dollar's going down. 
Now, we were talking, I was talking with some people before I started, gold and silver look like they're meandering, right? But in 1971, gold was $42 an ounce. Right now, it's about $2,000 an ounce. So if in 1971, you converted, now you couldn't buy gold in 71, you had to wait till 75. And in 75, people were buying Krugerrands, right? So in 75, if you spent 100 bucks an ounce and bought a whole ton of Krugerrands, and it went from 100 to 2,000, that's a pretty good return. So if you just look at a few years, then you're not gonna see that much. And a lot of it has to do with manipulation. So there's ETFs out there that banks can short. And there, so you've got derivatives that allow banks to control and manipulate the value of gold and silver. Because if gold and silver go through the roof, then the people know the jig's up on the dollar. So there's a lot of fighting to keep the cost of gold and silver as low as they can. So you might buy gold and silver coins or bars as a hedge against the inflation of the dollar. You might do it as savings for the future. People used to put five to 10% of their assets in gold and silver, but then everybody got into the NASDAQ, then everybody got into the Dow, then everybody got into housing and chasing all those different things. Gold and silver are a safe investment, a way to preserve your wealth. Beauty, quality, gifts for loved ones, right? If you're getting engaged, you're probably not giving a copper ring to your fiance some dudes I see wearing tungsten rings, doesn't make any sense. So I dare you to try to get engaged without giving gold or, or platinum. You're not gonna give silver, you're gonna give gold or platinum. And then tradition, right? People buy gold and silver for uh, tradition. And you can buy it at a coin shop, you can buy it online, there's different places to buy it. Uh, ways to invest. You could buy junk silver as old US coins. That's one of my favorite ways to buy, invest in silver is buy old dimes, quarters, halves, and silver dollars. You could buy government issued coins like Eagles or Maple Leafs from Canada or Krugerrands or Britannias or um, Pandas from China. So governments issue coins, but you also have what are known as rounds, which are generic coins made by mints. You can buy bars. You can get a one gram bar of gold, a 10 gram, a one ounce, all the way up to a thousand ounces, right? You can buy collectible coins, right? So when FDR confiscated our gold, if you had what were called collectible coins, numismatic coins, you were allowed to keep those. So a lot of people believe in owning numismatic coins before our tyrannical government takes our gold again. You could buy equities in mining companies like Newmont and Barrick and Gold Corp and Kinross. So they're traded on the stock exchange and a lot of them pay dividends. Uh, you can invest in ETFs based on the metal. GLD and SLV are the most common, but I don't like them. I'm not a financial advisor, so I probably should have a disclaimer on this, this slide. So I don't recommend GLD and SLV. If you want to buy an ETF, I recommend PHYS or PSLV out of Canada, run by Sprott. There's also ETFs based on mining shares. There's the GDX for the large miners. There's GDX for J for the junior miners. You can buy mutual funds. You can buy, go to, you know, out of the Perth Mint in Australia. You can buy certificates that represent gold that they're storing. They get stored for you as unallocated, allocated, or segregated. Or you can go mining for gold and pan for yourself. Now in Illinois, I looked this up, there's not much gold in like the Des Plaines River, <laughs> the Kankakee, Lake Michigan. You can try, I mean, you get a lot of exercise because you're not gonna find that much. But you can go out now, there was a new gold rush in California of sorts after they had this big you know, uh, flooding recently that exposed more gold. All right, so why do people sell to me, right? So I'm a big believer in gold and silver. I think people should own coins and bars, but they sell me usually non-investable stuff like old jewelry, right? They're downsizing. They're moving to a, you know, a smaller community. They're taking their $7,000 house on Sheridan Road, moving into a $4,000 little house on Ridge, right? So they're downsizing, they're decluttering. They wanna use the money for other investments. A lot of times I'll buy stuff from people and say, hey, you should go buy coins with this money. Uh, they might have special expenditures. They want to give, you know, a lot of people, they put in their will that I'm going to give my jewelry to my three kids. Well, how do they split it equitably? You convert it to cash. Now you can split it much, much easier. So I buy a lot from people who inherited this stuff. Jewelry goes out of fashion. Sell some year old. This is the line I pitched to uh, all the guys at the art fair this past weekend. I tried to get them to hand out my flyers. It didn't go very well. But I said, you can tell people, hey, Go sell this guy Kaz your out of fashion stuff and buy my jewelry. So I gave it a shot. Um, kids and grandkids don't want it. That's probably the biggest stuff. So most of my clients are, yeah, the majority of my clients tend to be older, you know, seniors. Kids don't want the flower. 
Grandkids don't, you know, know the value. They want plastic, right? They want stuff you can throw away. So thank you.